Amen. Praise the Lord. Happy to be back again and have this wonderful opportunity to address you from the word of the Lord. If you have a Bible, please turn with me to the book of Romans. Uh, Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 18 to 25. The topic given to me is, we believe in the spirit-filled life. Uh, but I'm also preaching according to my schedule. And uh, at this moment, I'm doing the book of Romans. And I'm at Romans chapter 4. So I took a look at the topic, and then I took a look at Romans chapter 4, and I realized that the word spirit is, I think, not mentioned in Romans chapter 4. So I was thinking, how am I going to preach this topic on, from this chapter? And I read it again, I read it again. I think there is something there in Romans chapter 4 that will fit this topic, okay, on what it means to live the spirit-filled life. So I'd like to call attention to chapter 4, verse 18 to 25. I'd like to read and uh, you follow along with me in your Bible. The chapter is about Abraham. And God promised him to give him a son. And, and the Bible says that Abraham had to trust in the Lord, had to believe in God, and especially in his promise to bless him with a son. And he has to wait many, many years, I think, all right, for, for that son. And uh, there were times he, he compromised his faith. There were times he he, 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 he relied on his own ability. He followed his own inclination instead of trusting the Lord. And, but at the end of it, because he trusted God and believed in God's promise, he, God blessed him and fulfilled the promise to bless him, uh, to give him a son. Okay? But he realized that it wasn't just the son. It was something else. Okay? And then soon, the Bible concluded by saying that uh, for us today, it wasn't just about Abraham. It wasn't just about that son, Isaac. It was something about what God wants to do in this world. And so uh, with that, I'd like to invite you to look at this topic from this angle that I'm looking at uh, in Romans chapter 4 on what it means to lead uh, the spirit-filled life. Verse 18 to 25. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. And that is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not only for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness. For us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. All right? And uh, it may, it may, I may require you to uh, look at it from, from a different perspective, but I, I, I feel uh, it will be a very challenging one on what it means to lead that spirit-filled uh, life. There are three cues I want to call your attention to. All right? Three cues that I want to call your attention to. And the first cue is uh, quantity. All right? The first cue is quantity. And the verse that I have for you is verse 18. And in verse 18 says, Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Now, I'm not suggesting that when you lead a spirit-filled life, you will be the father of many nations. Right? That you have many children. and all. No, that's not what I'm trying to say. But what I'm trying to say is that you will never be the same. You can never be the same. Right? If you are a spirit-filled Christian, the Holy Spirit lives in you, and not just lives in you, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. 
All right? That means you don't just have a part of Him, but the fullness of the Spirit is in you. At least that is your desire. That is what you want to have. And that is your prayer. And that is to be filled with the Holy Spirit every day of your life, every season of your life. And if that is the case, you can never remain the same person. Right? So quantity, right? that's the word I want to call attention to. Ephesians tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Right? And nobody, after becoming a Christian, or when he is filled with the Holy Spirit, ever remains the same. When he has the Spirit in him, he will definitely bear the fruit of kindness, of love, of joy, of peace, gentleness, self-control, and on and so forth. Right? He will definitely manifest the presence of the Spirit in his life. He will have new taste, new desire. He will want to give himself more and more to the things of the Lord. And that is what will happen when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit. When he believes in Jesus as his Lord and Savior, he is instantaneously changed in his personal profile from being a sinner to a child of God. He acquired a new taste in life and experienced a transformation progressively from one level to another. So, number one, all right, there will be external commitments. Right? External commitments. What do I mean by external commitments? He starts to pray. He comes to church. He reads his Bible. He gets involved. Right? And he gets involved more and more. Right? Maybe he started at level one. Then he goes to level two. Level three. He increased in his knowledge and on and so forth. And if possible, he would want to make a mission trip. Uh, but at least at the very beginning, he begins by saying prayer for his means. That is a transformation. Something that he has never done before. Right? When he, before he became a Christian. Before he, be, he was filled with the Spirit. Right? Maybe he, sing, he sings louder. Yeah? He sings uh, with, with, with courage. Right? He lifts up his hand. Right? He does action when he sings and prays the Lord. You know? ah, this is external commitment when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit. He gives of his finances. He allocates time in his busy schedule to serve the Lord. And there are times he go out of the way just to do that. And not just external commitments, but they are also measurable. Right? Like for example, you know, how many times he comes for services? How much of the Bible he reads? How many times does he pray? How many times when he was driving, he sings a song or he takes time to go away from the busy schedule and just to surrender everything. How many times in a day he thinks of God or, or in a week he thinks of God, right? So there are, it, is, it is measurable, okay? At one time, he never does any of these things, okay? But now that he believes in Jesus and he is filled with the Holy Spirit, there is this joy bubbling in him. And he just wants to go to church. He just wants to read the word of the Lord. He just finds himself naturally committing the situation to the Lord in prayer. And he is surprised because he is doing it on a more regular all right, basis. So it is measurable, all right, this external commitment that he is making to the Lord. And not just that, it is progressive in growth. Progressive in growth. Of course, there was season and uh, he was tired or he was weary or he was affected and he was distracted, you know. But nevertheless, he repents from it and he comes back to the Lord and he dedicates himself to the Lord again and he is on track again and he is ever experiencing in an increasing measure all right, the love of God and the joy of the Lord and the commitment to serve the Lord. So you see this tree in the life of Abraham. I'd like to illustrate. The Bible says that God called Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees, and that's where Iraq is, Babylon, and to leave his hometown and to go to a land that God will promise him. And the Bible says Abraham obeyed, and he left all right, Babylon, his hometown, and in search of the land that God promised to give to him. He does not know where is this land. 
He just followed the leading of the Spirit in his life. But believing that when he reached that land, wherever it is, God will tell him so. And so there was a change in his life. He left his hometown, his beautiful hometown, his secured hometown, his comfort zone, and go to where God asked him to go, although he does not know where it is. He was alone when he left. Of course, his wife was with him. He got his servant with him. But he was only one. And this is mentioned in the scripture in Isaiah 51 verse 2, where God says, Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth. When I call Abraham, he was only one man. God says, when I call him, he was only one man, one person. But I bless him, and I make him many. And so by the time Isaiah 51 verse 2 is written, the nation of Israel is already there. So there was multiplication, uh, multiplication, I don't know why I cannot pronounce my word today, right? And there's more than one. That means there was not just, I'm not saying that when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, there will be many of you. But what I'm saying is that, you know, you make external commitments, all right? Yeah, it's in measurable terms, and it is progressing, right? Your involvement in the work of the Lord. Abraham was childless, and he has become a father of many nations. And that includes all of us in this room, who have received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And all these were made possible because Abraham led a spirit-filled life. We can never be the same again right, if the Holy Spirit lives in us. Now, of course, sometimes, you know, we being Asian, we will say, no, yeah, I, live, I have the Spirit, but I'm still the same. Wow, that really, you know, makes things a bit difficult. But sometimes we do say things like that. I have the Spirit. Everybody claims I have the Spirit, but I feel my life. No, no, no. Actually, you do have some experiences. You do have some transformation changes to come into your life. It's just that you need to see it. You need to admit it. You need to appreciate it. Sometimes we see the big things, but not the smaller things. And we appreciate the big things and not the smaller things. And sometimes we got to take time. Yes, we may fail big, big. But God has blessed us and we have made good progress in small, small steps. We take time to give thanks for those small, small steps. All right? Believing that the Lord will help us in those so called. But then it is a matter of perspective only. Why is it big and why is it small? Okay? Ah, whatever it is, what I'm trying to say is that you take your mind off those negative and park it in the positive and you begin to see, yo, yes, hallelujah. God is doing a work in my life. And when you think of the positive, you become more positive, right? And you will grow deeper, right, in those things. And not only in those things, but in many other things, other areas that you have not been making good progress. Moses cried out unto the Lord, all right? And Moses says, I am not able. I am not able to do this. I am not able to do that. What was God's reply to him? God says, I am able. Moses says, he is not able, but God says, I am able. And that's where we, we quote the verse in Philippians where Paul says, we are able to do all things through Christ who strengthens us. The spirit-filled life is a life of possibilities. Hallelujah. It is a life of possibilities. Right? Not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm not saying that you're going to bring down the moon. I'm not saying, but, but positive changes will come into your life. You will see the external commitments that you're making. You will see in measurable terms, and you will feel the good progress that you're making because the Holy Spirit is living in you. Of course, the reverse can also happen when we don't give our life to the Spirit, when we are holding back then we begin to feel that we are not making good progress, but it's reversed, you know. We are stagnant or we are sliding back, you know, things like that. But when the Spirit lives in us, we make good progress forward for the Lord. There's a beautiful verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. It says like this, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. 
that he says here, for those who loved him, you may paraphrase and say, for those who are filled in the Spirit of the Lord. You never remain the same person. You will definitely be a different person. When you are led by the Spirit, when you are filled by the Spirit. So let your heart cry out like David. Let your heart cry out like King David. In Psalms when he says, Lord, take whatever you want, but don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Right? Let every day you begin, begin with the Holy Spirit. Let everything you do in church, whether it's a big thing or a small thing, never leave the Holy Spirit out of it. Ask Him to be your teacher. Ask Him to be your counselor. And when He speaks to you, respond. Because if not, the Holy Spirit may, may, may miracle. Teachers don't want to hear. Next time, you don't want to teach anymore. No. And it's true. Bible says, do not quench the Holy Spirit. Yes. Right? When we pray and ask the Spirit to teach us, He will teach you. But you must be teachable. All right? You cannot choose and pick and choose. He speaks to you. You open your heart. He helps you in your housework. He helps you in your career. He helps you in whatever competition that you're involved in. Not that you will win first prize all the time, but He is ever by your side. That means this growth that you see in your life is not just in church as a Christian religiously, no. But in your personal life, in your private life, in whatever area in your life, the Holy Spirit, He is always with you 24 hours and He's interested in everything that you do that brings glory to the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. And you will see the difference, the numerical growth, like what the Bible says about Abraham. Right? When he was led by the Spirit, right, he became the father of many nations. Why is it that I say Abraham was filled with the Spirit? Because the passage here talks about Abraham exercising the gift of faith. Who knows? Maybe Abraham was blessed with the gift of faith. And the gift of faith is one of the gifts of the Spirit. And so from there, you can say that Abraham was leading a Spirit-filled life. Maybe in your case, it's not about faith. In your case, maybe it is some other spiritual gifts or some other spiritual areas that the Holy Spirit is dealing in your life. But as you open your life to the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in your life, you can never be the same person anymore. Hallelujah. So that's what happened when we are led by the Spirit. Quantity is the first thing that will happen. Now let me take you to a second verse. Right, that's the verse I call attention to. Not only quantity, but quality. Okay? Not just quantity, but quality. You don't just ask how high, but you also ask how deep. You don't just ask how high. You don't talk about achievement, numbers, you know? Eh? Yes, those things are important. But you ask the question, how deep? You ask the question, it may be seen, but was it felt? It may be seen, but was it felt? Everybody heard you sang, but how many went home touched in their heart right, by the love of the Lord? Everybody heard your explanation, but how many were convinced of what you have said? So that will be my prayer as I preach this sermon. <laughs> Everybody loved your cooking, yeah, but how many went home and tried it out? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like my, my brother was, uh, he runs a jean shop. And I said to him, wow, you've got so many customers. Huh? He said, yeah, but more important is how many lives with a bag. <laughs> I can have a hundred, but nobody lives with a bag. What's the point? Yeah. All right. Anyway, so not just quantity, but quality. And where in this passage tells us about quality. In verse 20 to 22, that's the verse. It says, Yet Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Why? Because he heard from the Lord, God, bless, God said, I'll bless you with a son. But he waited for so many years, I think 25 years. So many years. Right? At least he, when, he, when God gave him the promise, he was within childbearing age. He can have a child. But he has come to a stage in his life, the Bible says, he was beyond childbearing age already. 
he waited that long and he has not received the child. And at one time, he tried to help God out and have a child to uh, the wife's maid servant. Okay, this is a practice during those days. Huh? We don't practice here today. And, and uh, he tried to help God out, but he realized it was a mistake. And it was a mistake that until today, they regretted. Right? But whatever it is, the Bible says, he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of the Lord. Yes, he makes a mistake. Yes, he was foolish, but he always come back to what God said to him, huh? all right? And was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being per fully persuaded that God had the power to do what he has promised. Full stop, yes. Yeah? Fully convinced. I don't know, maybe driven by despair. Maybe, you know, what's there to hope for? Just trust the Lord, lah. what to do? <laughs> I cannot do anything. <laughs> maybe, okay, okay, right? Maybe. But let's give him a benefit of doubt. He was that sure. He was that convinced. All the years of frustration did not dampen his spirit, but yet increased and confirmed. He was more sure as he come to the end of it that God is going to grant him that promise he made to him. Full stop. And finally, he has Isaac. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But what did the Bible say? The Bible says, the Bible did not say in this passage that I'm reading to you, that he finally had Isaac. A son was born to him, and that was Isaac. No. It says, this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. God gave him Isaac, yes. But Isaac was just a means. Isaac was not an end. Isaac was not it. Isaac has a story. Isaac has a purpose. But it was not finale. It was not it. It was not, yes, that's all that God had in mind when he wants to bless Abraham with Isaac. God introduced a new idea. God says, I had in mind righteousness. And that, in a sense, is something better, deeper than Isaac. And Abraham said, whoa, like that, uh, whoa, you know, can't have another one. Uh. <laughs> You know, and that's what I want to share with you. Sometimes we are caught up with a numbers game. Someone, sometimes we are caught up with statistics, achievements. Sometimes we are caught up with doing better. We did this, next year must do better. Of course, must do better. Lah, eh? I think we should. Eh? Amen. If he got bronze, next, next year must get silver. We get silver, next year must get gold. Ha! After gold is what? I don't know. Yeah, two gold, yeah. Next year, after that is two gold. Ha! We always want to be better, 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 better. Yes, yes, yes. But sometimes better may not necessarily be this way or this way. Better can be downwards. Right? It can be mean in terms of uh, quality. By now, Abraham had trusted God for many years. And many of those years were frustrating and weary, like what I say. He must have felt like giving up many times. Right? I say he tried to God help out. He tried to help God out at one time. Uh, by having a child through his wife's maid servant and was proven wrong. Abraham had come to a stage, a stage to fully say this, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And he begins to do that when he has what I call a mental shift. Right? A mental shift in his mind. You know, when we are ignorant, we will ask a lot of questions. Or when we are new like, in whatever field, we ask this question, we ask that question, you know. But when those questions were answered, we stop asking. And when we stop asking, we stop growing. Because we thought, that's it. That's it. You know, that's all about it. We don't need to know anymore. You know? But we fail to realize that we were just at that level. God is wanting to do more in our life. He wants us to go beyond. He wants us to go deeper to a new understanding. It is not necessarily what we thought it was, right? what God had in mind for us. And we need to have a mental shift. Abraham thought it was just Isaac, someone to carry his name, his tradition, his family. Huh? Just God's blessing to bless him. And that's it, you know. And inherit all his inheritance. He began to realize that it was more than that. It has to do with righteousness. And that's what 
God wants to do in his life. He needs a mental shift. He needs more than just a mental shift, but an internal maturity as well. Abraham reached a level of maturity in his spirit-filled life that when God asked him later to sacrifice Isaac, uh, this is after many, many years, at Mount Moriah, Abraham, Bible says, obeyed. Immediately the next morning, he took Isaac, his son, and went to this place. And when he reached there, he bound Isaac down, took out the knife, straight away, he's going to offer Isaac as a sacrifice without even thinking a second thought or anything at all. No question asked. Of course, an angel held him back and God gave Isaac back to Abraham and they offered an animal, a ram that happened to be there, provided by the Lord uh, as a sacrifice to God. There was internal maturity in Abraham. It wasn't just a mental shift. It wasn't just a new understanding. It was more than that. It was much deeper than that. And Abraham got it. He grabs it. He understood it. Right? And he was no longer the same. Serving God is not just about statistics. Serving God is not just about our boundaries right, and things like that. It is also spiritual. It is also spiritual. And it is also not just about we achieving our goals, objectives, and plus and plus. It's all well, good, and fine. Praise the Lord. You know, you know I heard the other day God complained to me. Of course, this is just a story, not a true one. Huh? Right. And you know what God complained to me? Everybody wants to tell me what they want to say, but nobody is interested to hear what I want to say. You know? Sometimes we need to pause for a while and say, God, what do you have in mind? What is it that you want to do? We need to cultivate that internal maturity. Later, Abraham gave specific instructions to his servant, Eliezer to return back to his hometown in Ur of Babylon and to find a wife for, from there for his son Isaac. Abraham has matured in his level, in his faith, in his spirit-filled life. You know, Why do you want to have the Holy Spirit? Let me ask you a question. I am very sure, I am quite sure that most of you will say, so that I can do this for the Lord. So that I can do this for the Lord. So that I can be this for the Lord. But how many in this room will say, so that I can be what God wants me to do? And that is number one. That means it's not what I had in mind. That I have the power, God gave me the power, I do what I had in mind for God. But it is so that I am given the power to do what God had in mind for me. That is the other way around. Abraham, of course he was not there at the beginning. But as he grew in age and grow in the spirit, he came, he come to that position. It's no longer about me. It's about what God wants to do in my life. It's no longer about my family, about this inheritance I have passed to who and things like that. You know, it's no more about this. It's about what God wants to do in our life. And God will only do, and there is inner transformation in our life. And not just eternal maturity, but a spiritual agenda. And that spiritual agenda is God's agenda. God surprised Abraham when God declared him as righteous for his steadfast, steadfast love, uh, faith in the Lord. You know, Abraham thought because of his faith, he got Isaac. But God surprised him. Yes, he got Isaac, but more than Isaac. What God wants him to have, righteousness. Suddenly, it dawned upon Abraham that Isaac wasn't an end, but just a means to an end. We are very happy when God does something in our life. Get you a promotion, get you this, get you that, and a new addition in your family. Oh, wonderful, praise the Lord. We give glory to the Lord. But take time to be alone with the Lord and ask Him, Lord, why did you do that in my life? Is there something that you want to do? It may not be obvious in front of you, you know. It's just a means. God is using that to do something else. And sometimes we got so caught up with the immediate that we forgot that which God wants to do. And we missed the point. Right? So Abraham saw it. Abraham realized, yes, praise the Lord, Isaac, his son. Yes, through Isaac came the nation of Israel. Yes, but beyond Isaac or running parallel with Isaac, a spiritual agenda that God had in mind. And Abraham was declared righteous 
in the sight of God. And that is the whole purpose of the law of Moses. The whole purpose of the law of Moses. The whole purpose of the temple worship, the priesthood, the sacrifice, all these things go way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve disobeyed the law. All that God had in mind was reconciliation. The man and God is brought together as one. Amen. Praise the Lord. It wasn't about Isaac or a family or a nation, but the quest for righteousness before the Lord. Righteousness and not Isaac was God's spiritual agenda for the salvation of the world. Quality life in the spirit Feel life is when we say to God, not my will, but yours be done. Amen. Praise the Lord. And when we desire that, we will have quality life in the Spirit. Amen. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For what does it profit a man, he says elsewhere, if he gains the whole world and forfeit his own soul? Say not ye, there are four more months, then come the harvest, Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look to the fields, for they are already white for harvest. For whoever wants to save his life, Jesus also said, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for God's kingdom's sake will, will find it and keep it. Then I heard a voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Quality life. It's not what we do for Jesus. Quality life is when we give ourselves to Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, uh, like what they say in America, don't ask what God can do for you, but ask what you can do for God. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, let me come to my third point. We have quantity, right? Then we have quality. And what's the third point? Third point is we have quantum. <laughs> we have quantity, we have quality, and we have quantum. How high is qual quality? How deep is eh, oh yeah, sorry. How high is quantity? <laughs> how deep is quality? And how far is quantum? I don't know, maybe because of my age, and I'm, I'm very concerned about what I'm doing today, and when I'm no longer around, whether what I did will last. Is that your concern? Huh? You know? And, and I'm not thinking of my own personal thing, I'm thinking of the church, right? And what will become of the church when, let's say, all of us in this room are no longer around? Of course, there were other people, lah, right? But what will be the condition like? And that's what quantum is all about, right? That's what quantum is all about. Verse 25. Verse 25 says, He was delivered, Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins, and He was raised to life for our justification. But earlier on in verse 24, it says, and not only, uh, when it says, uh, it was credited to Abraham, was written. It was written not just for Abraham only, but verse 24 says, but it was also written for us. Right? For us who believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, who was raised from the dead. Right? And then the last verse says, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. God opened a little door for Abraham. He asked Abraham, take a look. What do you see? A baby. <laughs> God said, I'm going to give you a baby. You sure? Yes. Ooh, you're exciting. Yes. Yeah. Then the, finally the baby arrived. Then God opened a little window. What do you see? I see righteousness. Yes. That's what I want to do in your life. Not just give you Isaac so that you will be right with me. Right? And you are right because you trusted me and you believe in me. 
Oh, Abraham was excited. I got two things now, Isaac, and I'm right with God. Amen. And then God said, you got one more window. Got one more window. And he opened the window. And Abraham take a look. Oh, church of praise, book it in there. Oh. <laughs> and that's why I say it is exciting to follow Jesus. It is exciting to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes, you are important. Yes, your needs are relevant. And God, by His grace and mercy, will provide for you according to His riches in glory and according to His will. You matter before Him. He loves you. He wants to bless you. He wants to help you. But please, right? there is another window that God wants to open. Whatever God does in your life has, is related to what He wants to do tomorrow. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not important. But after us, many will come. After us, many will come. And after them, many more will come. If tomorrow, everybody stop giving birth, then we can stop preaching the gospel. <laughs> then we can stop selling insurance. We can stop working. We can stop doing everything that we are doing today. Right? But because tomorrow, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, Many more will, will, will come. So what are we doing today that will help address the issues there tomorrow? That help address, and that's what quantum is all about. And that's what the spirit-filled life is all about. It's not just about us. It's not just about our generation, our needs, our wants. They are relevant, they are important. Yes, yes, yes. But take your eyes off and see in the future. What we do today will help address the issues there. And that's what a spirit-filled life is all about. Amen? Amen. <laughs> God told Abraham, justification. And that's what God wants to do at the end of the day. Not just Abraham only, not just his immediate family but the entire world. And when we talk about the entire world, not just the world there and then, but the world to come, the world to come, the world to come, the world to come. This generation, next generation, next generation, ne until the ends of the world, Jesus says. Finally, uh, we are brought to bear that it wasn't about a man by the name of Abraham, and it wasn't just about God's promise to bless him with a son, not even the nation of Israel and not even the promised land. You know, it wasn't all just about that. It was about the salvation of the whole world. And from the story of Abraham and the birth of the promised son, we are introduced to the promise of deliverance for our sins, the resurrection of Jesus to life, and our justification before the Lord. And not just you, everybody, not just the color of skin, any color, huh? Okay. I don't know whether it will, we can include the pondan and uh, trans suicide. <laughs> we got so many issues today. Right? Right? But the gospel, the grace of God is sufficient at all times. Amen. And when there is a need, God will raise up His men and women, fill them with the Holy Spirit, address those issues. But the question is, what are we doing today all right, to contribute to that? Hallelujah. Don't break the chain. Don't break the flow, all right? Live the spirit-filled life, okay? But don't be too caught up with all your own needs. Look beyond into the future. Get excited. What I'm doing today is for destiny. Amen. Praise the Lord. So for that, we need to do three things. Three L. We need to take the leap of faith, all right? We need to take the leap of faith. The quantum leap is the leap of faith. A leap to do something we have never done before. Right? To dream the impossible. To ask God for the nations. Wow. You know, yes. To get out of our comfort zone. Amen. And that's why, you know, if we go alone, it's very frightening. Right? But because we are so many of us, we are together in this. Right? And so it is safer in a sense. Okay? But there will come a time. God may challenge you as an individual. God may challenge you as a group. May God may challenge us as a church, you know, to take that leap of faith. We don't know whether we will make it or not, but that leap we have to take, but within reasonableness, right? And after much calculation and all the anger and things like that, the anger and how hard we live, we will land where God wants us to land. Amen. Praise the Lord. Right? 
and do what the Lord has called us to do. Amen. Praise the Lord. Say to your neighbor, it is exciting to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us take that leap of faith. Amen. Oh, that's very quiet. <laughs> And not just the leap of faith, but longevity. What do I mean by longevity here is that it is not just today. It's not just this season of haze, all right? economy downturn, or whatever that is going on in the world. But it is in the real world, the world to come. We are sowing seeds today. All right? And these seeds will germinate, bear fruits for the future. Let's live for the future. Right? Let's do what we need to do today as we are led by the Spirit of the Lord. Because the Spirit of the Lord, the Bible says, knows all things. Yes. He whispers to you. He guides you. He counsels you. What we need to do today for what's going to happen in the future. Yes, we have needs. But don't get too caught up with those needs. Don't let those needs numb your spiritual senses that you are not able to respond to the prompting of the Spirit in our hearts, in what God wants to do in the world to come. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. And so longevity, what we do today, we want it to last till tomorrow, and the day before, and in many, many years to come. Live for the future. You will always have a future to live for. Amen. And not just that, we leave behind a legacy. It is a quantum leap for legacy because it is not about us, it's not about our achievements, it's not our names. Our names will not be written on this wall, but the name of Jesus will be written in all the hearts of people who have opened their hearts.